how to maintain a nuclear infrastructure to support such a system. You have got to be able to build and develop and maintain nuclear submarines. And they're all associated with warheads and missiles. You've got to have the crews to support them. If you look at the UK's uh, submarine uh, infrastructure at the moment, the UK needs four ballistic missile submarines. It needs about eight um, attack <coughs> submarines. It needs 12 boats. But to maintain the nuclear infrastructure, assuming each boat lasts 30 years, we actually need to build 15 submarines over that period. We need a force of 15 submarines. So we have to build more submarines than we actually need because we've gone down a particular delivery type of system. So a significant financial costs and benefits associated with our control and disarmament. The sixth benefit that we might be able to see is the level of international engagement one can get. QDOS at the regional and global levels. The influence it brings in terms of partners and allies, a potential um, signal in excess to other parties. Those are all benefits to be calculated against the security dynamics out there. But when you also think about how things like the M uh, MTCR is going to go, I would suggest we're dealing with five real challenges for the future. <coughs> Two of them about technology. It's worth remembering when we look at the missile technology control regime, we're not just talking about ballistic missiles. It also has a responsibility for things like UAVs. And actually one of the things we're seeing with UAV technology is its proliferation both amongst states and to non-state actors. <coughs> the ability of UAV potentially to carry quite significant loads. Amazon, for example, was looking into, into a UAV delivery system to deliver whatever books, etc. you want to order, or whatever things you want to order on Amazon, it will deliver by UAVs. Potentially some of those things can, can carry quite significant payloads. <coughs> Ergo, that same civilian dual-use technology can be used to carry um, other capabilities, nuclear weapons, for example. Second big challenge we're going to have up is about the control of the technology. With the advent of 3D printers, increasingly other organizations, not just states, will be able to maintain and control some of the technology out there. Which leads on to the third big challenge, is the proliferation of potential weapons of mass destruction to non-state actors. Um, and we all know the, the dangers that might bring. The fourth challenge, when we're thinking about nuclear use and arms control, is going to be about how we inter see the, diff the interaction of the different environments. We often talk about air, sea, and land, but we're increasingly now talking about space and cyber. Does deterrence work across these different dynamics? Does nuclear deterrence work in the cyber domain? Does cyber deterrence work across? Can you use one type of technology to, to impose deterrence on the other? Central key question before NATO at the moment, I suspect for others. The final challenge, and it's a known unknown in that classic Rumsfeldian language, is we know that new president is Donald Trump. We also know he's come up with a whole series of different statements, um, which some of which signal quite radical changes in US foreign policy. If you think taking a telephone call from the uh, Taiwanese president can be interpreted two ways. One way is he just thought it was a telephone call, he didn't really understand the significance of taking a telephone call. Or the second interpretation is he's changed US policy of 40 years by recognizing Taiwan and now go upsetting mainland China. The Trump administration is going to change things. <coughs> if you look at some of his, 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 his language, some of the things he came up with during the stump speeches, he talked about increased proliferation. Why doesn't Japan and South Korea are? And so that's one of the things he's advocated <coughs> is proliferation. That we should actually start to look at this technology being handed over to others. Whether he actually wants to do that in, in office is another matter. We've also got questions about things like the US nuclear guarantee to its allies and its protection over its allies. He's already questioned Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, whether that should apply, or whether it's on a case-by-case -case basis. In a sense, what we're seeing potentially with the Trump administration is we know things are going to be different. We just don't know how different they are. And these will have a knock-on effect in terms of how inter international relations occur, how diplomacy occurs, the 
the continuity and um, importance of arms control and disarmament or whether that will continue. And on that happy note, I shall challenge, I will happily pass on the baton to the next speaker. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Darwin. Uh, my next speaker on the list is Mr. Kamran Akhtar. And has, uh, amongst other things, worked closely with me in Vienna. Uh, Mr. Kamran Akhtar is presently Director General Disarmament in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He joined the ministry as a career diplomat in 1995. Prior to uh, joining the ministry, he has he has served in the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, Mr. Kamran Akhtar was also Director of Disarmament from 2005 to 2010. He was Director General Science and Technology in the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Conference in Jeddah from 2010 to 2015. He has been involved in a wide range of international associations on arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation issues. He has been part of several bilateral dialogues, including Pakistan, India, nuclear and conventional uh, CBMs. Mr. Kamran Akhtar uh, is one of those special officers in the Foreign Service who has a scientific degree. He uh, did his MSc in physics, uh, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, and, and therefore, he has a uh, grasp of the subject much more than other Okay, if uh, you don't mind, I would like to uh, make my talk from here because uh, I was not feeling well till yesterday and still I have a very bad cough. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I would just like to give a small disclaimer. I do not have a written text with me. And for that reason, I would like to clarify that whatever I say is in my personal capacity as the practitioner of arms control and disarmament issues. And it is not reflected of the official position of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, talk about the membership uh, applications of Pakistan and India of the nuclear supplies group and subsequently Indian membership of MDCR. So I would like to just talk about a few salient issues involved in that uh, process rather than going into the politics or the uh, details of the process itself. Uh, the previous speaker has raised certain points. I would like to touch upon them as I go through my talk. Uh, what is the rationale for Pakistan applying for the NSC? Number one, we would like to be mainstream in the international nuclear order. Uh, as a responsible nuclear weapon state. India has already been granted an exemption and India's case for membership is being pushed strongly and there is no reason why Pakistan should not be in the club as well. Because after all, Pakistan was not the one which was responsible for proliferation of nuclear weapons. It was not the one uh, responsible for nuclearization of South Asia. It only responded to an urgent security threat. That is why Pakistan does not see itself as a proliferator. In fact, we have been trying to keep South Asia free of nuclear weapons since 1974, when India conducted its first nuclear test. We used to move a resolution at the UN General Assembly calling for keeping South Asia free of nuclear weapons. And uh, till 1998, uh, we continued to do that. However, in 1998, the situation on ground evolved. And since then, we have been proposing a strategic restraint regime to India. We have been talking about the need for arms control. And we do recognize the value of arms control and arms limitation, as pointed out by the previous speaker. And that is why we think that this uh, issue of membership offers an opportunity to all the NSC countries to require both Pakistan and India to adhere simultaneously to certain non-proliferation commitments. That will not only strengthen the non-proliferation objectives of the NSG, but also inject restraint in the South Asian context. 
and by doing so, the NSC countries will also fulfill their responsibility towards strategic stability. After all, the non-proliferation objective is not an esoteric pursuit. It's not being pursued in a vacuum. It's linked with the objective of maintaining international and global peace and security and stability. So when you talk about non-proliferation, you have to look at the linked objective of maintaining strategic stability and peace in the region. If the NSC fails to come up with criteria which promote restraints in the region and once again goes down the path of uh, granting an exemption to India, then we are afraid that the NSC will fail in its non-proliferation objective. Another reason for Pakistan to apply for NSG is that we have legitimate needs for socio-economic development. We need to have a robust uh, and varied energy mix to uh, guarantee energy security. And nuclear energy is one of the sources. We are looking at renewables, we are looking at other alternatives, but to have a base load uh, security, we need to look at the nuclear option as well. And we have more than 30 years of experience in terms of safe operation of nuclear power plants, more than 40 years of experience, in fact. And we think we have the requisite manpower, <coughs> requisite expertise to manage it well and to uh, uh, have uh, contribute to the international uh, movement towards peaceful uses of nuclear energy. <coughs> Finally, Pakistan has a sizable civilian nuclear program. We have the ability to manufacture several items on the NSG control list, and as such, we are a potential supplier. We have industries in the mm -hmm. private sector which have the technical know-how and the ability to produce items on the NSG list. So far, we have been very restrictive in terms of allowing any exports to uh, countries uh, uh, of the items which are on the NSG list, but this cannot continue like that forever. After all, we also have legitimate commercial interests. Is PhD on nuclear non-proliferation the nuclear non-proliferation treaty was supervised by Kings uh, at Kings by Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman. He read history and politics at Christchurch University of Oxford. And very interestingly, uh, Dr. Matthew Harris uh, was in Oxford and at Christchurch at the same time that Bilawal Bhutto was there. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I give you just a, a small trivia to point out. I now feel bound to clarify that the subject of my uh, remarks uh, will be the NSG and not uh, any member of uh, the Bhutto family. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be in Islamabad. Uh, it's my first visit to Islamabad and my first visit to Pakistan, and I'm very much enjoying it so far. Uh, as I said, I'll talk about the NSG, as my colleague Andrew uh, talked about the MTCR. And I want to start off with the observation that the NSG has been an evolving institution uh, ever since it was established in 1974. As you know, it was founded that year in response to India's nuclear test driven by the realization that the NPT alone would not be enough to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons because of the risk, in particular, of the diversion of nuclear exports for peaceful purposes. And since its founding, I think we can say that the NSG has gone through at least three waves of development and evolution. Firstly, in the 1970s, an effort to define the scope of sensitive nuclear technology and agree basic exports and guidelines for controlling supply. And those guidelines, the first set of guidelines was agreed in 1978. Secondly, in the 1990s, a reaction to the Gulf War and the exposure of Iraq's complex nuclear weapons program and the procurement structures that had allowed it to come into being. And in particular, this meant a move to address dual use technologies, resulting in a second set of guidelines for those items and, crucially, the requirement of full-scope IAEA safeguards as a condition of supply for trigger list items. And thirdly, uh, a change from the early 2000s onwards, driven by the shock of 9-11, and in particular the 2004 revelation of the proliferation activities of the AQ Khan network. This meant the adoption of a catch-all provision in 2004 
allowing NSG members to block an export suspected to be intended for a nuclear weapons program, even if not otherwise controlled. So in the NSG's more than four decades of existence, its rules have evolved in response to changing circumstances. And I think many would argue that its flexibility and its voluntary nature uh, are what has given it strength. And during, it, during that time, its membership has also grown as more and more countries have become capable of exporting controlled items. It now has 48 members. The evolution of the NSG's membership and its guidelines reflects a changing global nuclear environment. More countries than ever before are capable of exporting controlled items, especially dual use items, and proliferation procurement has been shown to be deeply complex, crossing multiple national borders rather than just requiring direct point-to-point -point trade, and involving considerable <coughs> private sector participation. Now the NSG has always existed in parallel to the NPT and aiming in part to